Um, I am Dr. Ira Kirschenbaum, the editor of the Journal of Orthopedic Experience Innovation. Tonight, we have the great pleasure to have the uh, almost the entire author um, team of um, this, this great article, um, which I'm bringing up. I think you can see increased stiff risk of stiffness following total knee arthroplasty with direct oral anticoagulants and avoidance of selective COX-2 inhibitors. I'm glad I finally got the article correct, John, and uh, thank you for catching me on that, uh, working into the night. This is a superb article, got 234 views already, um, which is high, 19 downloads. Just to give you perspective, the average journal article in JOA gets 67 views. So to get 234 views is, is really superb for, for, for any article. I'm going to take this off and I'm going to ask the authors to introduce themselves and we'll we'll get some stuff. So uh, I'll start with John. John, could I see you there? Hi, guys. John Cooper, uh, orthopedic hip and knee surgeon. I'm at Columbia uh, University Medical Center, which is where uh, we did this study. Jeff? Okay. Alex? Hey, everyone. Um, Alex Newworth, uh, also hip and knee surgeon at Columbia um, and a, a partner of uh, John's, uh, Jeff's, and, and Roshan's. Okay. Roshan Shah. Roshan, um, nice to see you all here. Thanks for coming. This is a pretty cool paper. John's um, the motivating factor behind the uh, article and the study design, and i um, just uh, happy to be a part of it. Uh, but it's changed my practice. Excellent. Well, we'll talk a lot about that. And Jeff? Hey everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Geller, also part of the faculty at Columbia, and I'm super lucky to have such a great group of, of partners. Uh, we collaborate really a ton on a variety of different research topics, and this is one topic really which is, is extremely practical, has, has changed our practice patterns, and, and hopefully everybody learns a little bit about you know, how we do it, why we do it, and the effect it's had. And I'd also like to introduce Cynthia Kallenberg, uh, who was very involved a, a, as I was told, as the inspiration for this work. Uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself, please, Cynthia. Thanks very much. I'm a um, new, uh, recently graduated from fellowship, hip and knee surgeon now at Hospital for Special Surgery. I did a uh, sub I as a medical student back in the day with Dr. Geller, which was one of my first exposures to joint replacement surgery. And I remember uh, that <laughs> a little ways back and looked, uh, looked at this issue of anticoagulation um, in total knee replacement uh, back in 2018 when I was a resident with, with some colleagues at HSS um, and did sort of a, a precursor study to, to the study that was, is being discussed tonight. So uh, honored to be here with the with the Columbia crew. All right, this is great. Um, so I'm just admitting a couple more people. Um, I'd like uh, one of the authors to start off and tell us a little bit about how this came about, because any type of innovative study like this has to have a spark and have to have a reason. So what was the why of the study, in a sense? So I, I, I'll, I'll take that one. So this okay. this was a study that um, you know really came about. It, it's one of those studies that comes about. You know how sometimes you're sitting at AUKUS and you hear somebody else giving a talk and, and you're like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Or I see that too, and, and it sparks sort of this side tangent, and, and you take it in that direction. Um, I, I was um, reading um, Cindy's article uh, that she published. I think, gosh, when Cindy five years ago or so. Um, in JBJS, and I think I was reading the print version of it. Um, and uh, she's going to talk a little bit about about that paper, just as a as an overview. But you know, I I, I said, gosh, I noticed the exact same thing in the patients I take care of. The 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 people who were doing total knees on who end up needing to take Zeralto or Eliquis um, after surgery. You know, sometimes they just don't do as well when everything else seems to be going great and they've got a great surgery. I struggle with range of motion a little bit more on those patients. And uh, so I, I saw that, I was observing that and, and Cindy very, very eloquently um, described that. And um, actually this, this is a good segue, Cindy, if you, if you don't mind um, leading off with just a you know, overview of what you found a few years ago. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, again, honored to be here tonight to chat with you guys. So we, uh, I wrote a paper back in 2018 with some, uh, again, with some colleagues from HSS looking at uh, type of anticoagulant used after total knee affecting the rate of MUA for postoperative stiffness. Um, and what we did was, uh, you know, we had actually been inspired by a, a small paper written in the journal uh, Knee that looked at warfarin specifically being associated with higher rates of arthrofibrosis. And we decided to look at this on a population scale using the Pearl Diver database, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, so we, in this paper that we wrote a few years ago, looked at a cohort of 32,000 patients who underwent total knees. Uh, with the primary variable of interest being what anticoagulation uh, agent they were prescribed. And we were looking at whether it was associated with the risk of MUA within six months after surgery. Um, the specific anticoagulant groups we looked at were aspirin as the first group, low molecular weight heparin as the second group, warfarin as the third group, factor 10A inhibitors, which we all lumped together as the fourth group, and then Fonda Paradox, which was a small fifth group, uh, which is a Trixa. Um, we did a multivariable analysis looking for age, sex, comorbidities, like, and length of stay uh, as our covariates. And we found in this model a significant increase in the risk of MUA for patients who received warfarin direct 10A inhibitors or Fonda Paranox in comparison to low molecular weight heparin or aspirin. So, so the, uh, the warfarin and the direct 10A inhibitor groups were, were at higher risk of MUA within the first six months after surgery on this sort of large population scale. Um, so given that this was a database study, it was definitely subject to some of the weaknesses that we're familiar, you know, we're all familiar with in database studies um, without patient level data or surgeon level data, such as, you know, specific surgeon indications for MUA patient factors that may uh, increase or decrease the likelihood of MUA and other concomitant medications that come into play, such as NSAIDs, which I'm sure we'll get to more. Um, but again, so being a, a database study, this was really more hypothesis generating rather than establishing cause and effect. But we did hypothesize a few different reasons for the increased rate of MUA that we clearly saw on patients who are taking uh, factor 10A inhibitors and warfarin. One is that sicker patients are often on higher levels of anticoagulation, which may inher inherently lower the risk of MUA if the patient and surgeon have more trepidation about going back to the OR or back under anesthesia because of um, medical you know, comorbidities. So that may limit the, the risk of MUA in those patients who are on more anticoagulation. Two, um, warfarin has been shown to be you know, clearly a potent anti- uh, uh, anti-protein C inhibitor. Um, and protein C is known to be a powerful anti-inflammatory molecule in the body that could uh, prevent arthrofibrosis in the knee. Um, so that, you know, specifically for warfarin may be one of the reasons that patients on warfarin have a higher risk. And then third, and perhaps most importantly, uh, to the subsequent study that we're discussing tonight is the fact that, um, you know, surgeons are very commonly more, um, have more trepidation about uh, prescribing NSAIDs in association with higher level anticoagulation. So things that like people oftentimes don't want to prescribe additional NSAIDs if patients are already on factor 10A inhibitors or um, other heavier duty anticoagulants. Um, and that we, you know, hypothesize could be one of the reasons that these patients end up uh, undergoing MUA. Um, so hopefully that provides a reasonable segue um, for you guys to, to discuss the paper at hand, which I think, you know, really eloquently um, looked at the specifics for this and, and how we can really apply it to our practice and, and improve outcomes for total knee patients. Great. John, what do you, who, who do you want to pop up? Yeah, so, so Cindy, I think that, you know, that, that, that was a perfect description of, of, of your paper. And, you know, when I read it, I, you know, we we weren't using a ton of uh, warfarin at the time. I, I think I, I doubt that many people use warfarin regularly in, in anticoagulation for knee replacement. It, it's a little bit of a historical thing, unless unless a patient comes on, um, you know, into surgery on warfarin. Um, but but for the most part, I, I think you know the standard of care now is is uh, for a lot of places aspirin, uh, unless the patient's at a higher risk or is taking one of these, um, you know, factor 10A or or we call them DOAC anticoagulants, uh, which are, which are pretty common. I mean, we see those pretty commonly, um, or risk stratified patients who are at a high risk for bleeding and, and to patients who, who need something maybe 
you know, m more potent than aspirin. Um, but, but Jeff, Jeff Geller, you've been at Columbia longer than, longer than any of the authorship team. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, our anticoagulation management of patients getting knee replacements and, and kind of this, this question about what the right thing to do for these kinds of higher risk patients are, those who need these DOACs. Thanks, John. And, and great job, Cindy. Man, you're absolutely right. The, um, you know, this is a real key clinical question. And, you know, as you sort of presented all your data about, you know, the risk of stiffness and how much uh, the anticoagulant affects it, um, it, it really sort of, you know, shed a lot of light towards, well, you know, what, what are, what are we doing? Are we doing things just out of dogma? Are we doing things with real, you know, scientific background? What, what you know, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And, and how much is this really impactful with regard to, you know, is it the anti-inflammatory that really helps diminish the risk of, of arthrofibrosis in these patients? Is it the actual anticoagulant that is promoting some sort of process on, on the molecular level to increase fibrosis, as you suggested, protein C, any of the pro prostaglandins, you know, it really is an unanswered question and very difficult to do because um, whether a patient's placed on a DOAC uh, postoperatively because they're higher risk or, uh, as you suggested, they're a little on the sicker side, they, they perhaps are a little bit less mobile, they're not going home, they may be going to a rehab. So do they have other, you know, some other sort of concomitant medical issue that's preventing them from, from being on an NSAID, some sort of chronic renal insufficiency. <clears throat> and, and the reality is most of these folks are really placed on a higher level of, of anticoagulation simply because of a risk stratification algorithm. And there, there really isn't any other sort of contraindication to putting them on, on an NSAID. You know, it's, it's, it's clear that, that patients who are on aspirin postoperatively uh, are able to take an anti-inflammatory you know, there's plenty of evidence out there to show that, that they, lead, they need less pain medication, their progress is, is typically a little faster. And so we thought to ourselves, well, well how do we isolate the anti-inflammatory as, you know, an independent risk factor for, you know, contributing to the stiffness? Now, all these years, um, you know, I've been in practice since 2005, um, and I'm sure, Ira, you, rec you remember, you know, in those days, everybody got, you know, Lovenox, Yep. Um, uh, or warfarin, and uh, <clears throat> you know, people really didn't get anti-inflammatories. There was a push towards anti-inflammatory as we kind of transitioned away from Lovenox. Um, maybe you're on Lovenox for you know two, three weeks, and then you could go on some sort of you know lower level anticoagulation like aspirin, and you know add in an anti-inflammatory, and maybe that was enough. But you know, fortunately, as as we sort of migrated into this lower level of anticoagulation and aspirin use. Um, we found that, you know, with the implementation of multimodal pain management, NSAIDs were a key component, right? And so now all of a sudden, if those got taken away from our patients, well, that really made a big difference. So that's sort of how we, we kind of arrived at, at the study question. Uh, you know, John really did a great job kind of organizing it, um, you know, collecting the patients together, figuring out a, a, a study methodology. And it made perfect sense because, you know, with a busy tertiary care arthroplasty center like ours, we had all shapes and sizes of patients and we were able to, to really, you know, tap into a large uh, database of patients. Ultimately, we had uh, just under about 2000 patients that we, we looked at, uh, we, we settled on, you know, after exclusion criteria and so forth, we had just about over 1300 study patients in our group. And, um, you know, that, that was really a, a solidly uh, powered study that we could look at all these different cohorts. Now, by far, the vast majority of them were aspirin patients, but we had plenty of patients. We had about close to 300 patients um, on, on DOAX and, and um, you know, we were able to sort of parse through the data and figure out, well, who was able to take an NSAID and who wasn't. And you think about it sort of logically, well, you know, the, the NSAID that we typically used was Celebrex. Uh, why? Because it's a COX-2 specific inhibitor and really theoretically shouldn't interfere with all of the, the uh, bleeding cascades of the DOAC. So it really, it was a great study question. It's practical and it really helped us with trying to hone in on a study question. So um, one, one of the things, Jeff, I think that also helped us is that we, we didn't really know what to do. 
as the right answer. So in, you know, in any institution with more than one surgeon, you're going to get a little bit of variability of practice patterns. And, you know, one or two of us might've been a little bit more willing to push the envelope and, and sort of give insets with the, you know, with Seralto and, and, and other, others of us were very much um, strict in not doing that. And some of us changed over time and, you know, some patients we would push it a little bit and some we wouldn't. And so we had this sort of variable population where some, some got the anticoagulation with the insets and some didn't. And um, I, we, we kind of talked about this as a group, you know, New Earth and Sean and Geller and I, and we, we thought, you know, um, Cindy's study from, from special surgery did a wonderful job of making that association between anticoagulation and stiffness. But that why that she talked about, you know, what was the, what was the connection was, was missing in the, in the, in the large national database study. You just can't make those associations. So we tried to look at a little bit more of a population level or patient level data to sort of try to parse out some of these variables. And um, uh, uh, Dr. Newworth, uh, do you mind going into a little yes. bit of our methodology? Yeah, let's talk a little bit about our, our methods and, and our results. And I think we alluded to, to, to some of it already, but we'll dive into a little bit more detail. So basically, we looked at retrospectively at our own registry data here at Columbia, looking at primary knee replacements that were done between 2014 and, and 2019. Um, and then we looked at which thromboembolic prophylaxis uh, was used postoperatively um, and whether or not an anti-inflammatory was uh, prescribed with uh, that uh, uh, with that um, uh, thromboembolic prophylaxis. So we looked at MUA rates in the first year after surgery. Um, we looked at which anti-inflammatory was used and which um, VT prophylaxis was used. Um, we looked at pre-op and post-operative motion uh, at various uh, post-operative uh, time intervals, as well as, like I said, pre-operatively. Um, in terms of which uh, anticoagulation uh, we use here at Columbia, we, we um, use a, a risk stratification tool, which was uh, perfected here by, by Dr. Cooper, but really comes out of the Parvizi data. Um, and we routinely use it for all of our patients to determine whether or not they're a candidate for uh, aspirin or whether they should be on a uh, direct uh, oral anticoagulant. So that's, that's how we determined um, generally how our patients are, are categorized. Um, we then stratified into three groups, uh, one group being um, aspirin uh, with the routine use of an anti-inflammatory, um, a DOAC only, um, or a, a DOAC uh, with the use of a, an anti-inflammatory. And the anti-inflammatory, like Dr. Geller said, was either meloxicam um, or acilococcin. Um, the indications for MUA were, were uh, basically individually um, determined by the surgeon based on post-operative range of motion at six and 12 weeks. Um, so when we look at our cohort, um, you know, we, we ended up with, with uh, over 1,300 uh, knees that met our inclusion criteria, nearly 80% of which were, were risk stratified to using aspirin. And not surprising, most patients do get aspirin and, and about 21% uh, of, of which received a direct oral anticoagulant. Um, our, our, our standard typically was rivaroxaban 10 milligrams daily, um, although uh, some patients uh, did utilize various doses of other anti-coagulation um, uh, medications, uh, including um, uh, apixaban and abigatran. Um, so about 1,000 patients received aspirin and an NSAID, uh, close to 200 patients, 195 received a DOAC and an NSAID, and 92 patients received a DOAC only without the addition of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, patients who were on, on warfarin or clopidogrel preoperatively were continued on that and were uh, excluded uh, from uh, our study. Um, so, you know, if you turn your attention basically to table three, looking at our results and sort of the, the most important results, uh, when you look, compare uh, aspirin to a DOAC uh, and aspirin to a DOAC plus an anti-inflammatory, uh, you'll see that we didn't find a significant difference in MUA rates comparing aspirin to all DOACs. Uh, but we did notice a significant difference between aspirin uh, and a DOAC alone with an odds ratio of, of over three. Um, in terms of achieving a range of motion of greater the, to, than, than 118 degrees, so a nice functional range of motion, 55% uh, uh, of those on aspirin achieved that uh, versus 43% on those uh, with a DOAC plus an anti-inflammatory and 38.5% uh, who did not have the DOAC plus the anti-inflammatory. When you compare DOAC with an NSAID versus a DOAC alone, uh, looking at MUA rates, we did not really find a significant difference between uh, the two, uh, although uh, the statistical trends were in favor of a DOAC plus an anti-inflammatory. Uh, we didn't find a significant change in pre-op and six weeks motion patients achieving 118 degrees, 
Um, and likely because we're underpowered, though, Dr. Shah may talk about limitations in more detail, uh, either at three months or at one year. Um, of note, uh, important finding is we had no bleeding complications in the DOAC and the anti-inflammatory group. So often there are concerns about uh, the addition of an anti-inflammatory and the bleeding risk and hemarthrosis and hematoma formation, and, and we did not identify uh, any. Um, so, so basically the, the major take home from, from our study is, is really, um, you know, the, we, we seem to identify uh, some uh, degree of mitigating uh, in risks uh, by adding an anti-inflammatory to a, a DOAC. So when you compare uh, the motion of a patient uh, or the MUA rates of a patient who was on a DOAC versus one who was on a DOAC plus an anti-inflammatory, I think that we found a potential uh, protective effect of the COX-2 inhibitor when, when we uh, added the aspirin group. So Overall, um, a lot of data. Uh, I know it's a little dry to go over it uh, that way and happy to answer any question, but, uh, but those were the major uh, take homes of, of our study. I also wanna mention before we continue, if anyone has any questions at all, you could either raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll call on you to ask you, answer your question, to get your question answered. All right, uh, back and to you, John, or to-, to Yeah, John. yeah, so I wanted to say, save the best for last, so Dr. Dr. Shah. Um, to talk to us about, you know, why, why you think, you know, we found this, um, what are the, I mean, what are the possible mechanisms here that, that, you know, we, we know that, you know, from, from previous work that, that Cindy presented that the, the factor 10A inhibitors alone are risk factor for stiffness. Yet when we give these patients an anti-inflammatory with that, which is, you know, sometimes a little bit tab to do that, but when we, when we give these patients dual therapy with, with Celebrex plus Seralto, they don't seem to be to do quite as bad. Still, still not quite as good, but not quite as bad. Um, what do you think is going on here? Is this a real finding? And, and what are some of the limitations of our study here? Yeah, I mean, look, this is, um, I think, uh, summarized really well just now, John and, and Alex and your, and your data. And I I would I just summarize it one more time because I think it's it's easy to get lost in this. And it's, but DOAX, are bad for stiffness. They, they're associated with increased stiffness, increased manipulation, confirming Cindy study. In our study, we compared it with aspirin, which is by far the more most popular um, anticoagulant um, or prophylactic uh, agent in modern day total joint replacement. And in Cindy's study, it was Lovenox, with the aspirin group being fairly small in that study. So it's confirmatory with a different control group, which I think is really meaningful. And as John just said, anti-inflammatories somewhat mitigated that risk increased by the stronger anticoagulant. Is it a real finding? It, it is. I mean, this is good data. is a good number of patients. Uh, the initial confirmatory aspect and what we've all anecdotally, anecdotally seen in our practice with increased stiffness, slower recovery, I, I think, with the stronger anticoagulants, um, uh, th that's confirmed in the study, and I think that's great. Will anti-inflammatories improve that? Um, we haven't been able to completely answer that because of the power of our study. Uh, I think in our discussion, we mentioned something like 3,500 patients per group using Cindy's uh, study for the prompts for that uh, statistical significance. But <clears throat> short of that, I don't know that we definitely, you know, we necessarily need to. You know, we can theorize, uh, and there have been some good theories both in the JBJS paper and um, in prior literature as to why this is. I think the first, the most obvious one is you're giving a strong anticoagulant in a, in a surgical field that has been cut with bleeding bone that may not be fully covered by the implant. Um, and we're asking that patient to move that knee immediately after surgery. So there's a bleeding risk inherent to knee replacement worse than when we give them anticoagulants. Um, we didn't see that uh, as, a, as a significant finding in our study in terms of transfusions or um, hematomas. Um, but that was noted in the in Cindy's uh, study. Um, and that's in part because we have TXA uh, in modern day arthroplasty. But nonetheless, you can have symptomatic bleeding, if hemarthroses, long before you need a transfusion or a need to evacuate a hematoma. So I don't think that the lack of an objective finding of um, those outcomes means that we didn't have that in our patients who are getting oral anticoagulants. Um, pain, pain relief, the pain of the bleeding, of course, limits the ability to move that knee right away. Um, and the pain relief from an anti-inflammatory, uh, can improve that so that, that, you know, there's an immediate, you know, as long as the anti-inflammatory is not creating increased bleeding, which I think our, 
our study uh, confirms or, or it supports, then you're going to get some pain relief. You'll have a mechanistic improvement in the fibroblast proliferation, the um, uh, platelet aggregation. There's uh, mast cells uh, more in arthrofibrotic joints than, than uh, normal knee uh, synovium. And in some of the basic studies we've done at Columbia University, um, just the, the capsular fibrotic changes that occur after total knee replacement are lessened with, uh, in many of the rat studies, with, uh, with a corticosteroid, but of course a non-steroidal uh, has a similar effect, just with a smaller um, uh, effect size. Um, there are some biases here that we have to consider. We've talked about them. You know, the patients who are on anticoagulants who are, who are factoring into that group from our calculator are going to be more frail, more comorbidities. They may have renal disease that puts them at uh, another, you know, reason not to use anti-inflammatories. Um, and that can affect the, the final outcomes here. So there may be some stilt towards that um, population. But what was really cool about this study is giving that group an anti-inflammatory like Celebrex or Meloxicam reduced and mitigated that risk for stiffness. So it's it's a really it's a really nice intervention that we can use and that can change practice. Um, some other possible mechanisms. I guess I hit it all: the pain relief, the bleeding, at least the main ones I I can think of, um, and and I'm sure there are others. I gotta have a uh, a Richard uh, Southgate. How are you? How are you doing tonight, Rich? You had a question. Doing great. Uh, awesome. And you had a question, a statement about this. You want to ask the question publicly, just in case people did not look at the chat? Yeah, so um, this is a fascinating article. Um, it's really going to change how I manage my patients, uh, including my surgeries next week. Um, but so, yeah, my question was about the dosing. In the article, it was 200 daily. Um, I tend to dose it twice daily. So I was asking, you know, can we do it 100 twice daily or 200 milligrams twice daily? Uh, and how did you choose the dosing? The other question I'd want to add to that is how long are you placing these DOAC patients on Celebrex for? I think you, I think you're going to probably get some diff different answers here, Rich. Rich. Um, it's an interesting question and we don't have the answers to it. I think we've made the association that given these patients Anti-inflammatories helps to mitigate the, the DOAC risk, but we don't know how much or how long, or and they're still quite variable. So, so for me, I give every patient now, uh, unless there's a hard contraindication to, to anti-inflammatories, I give them 200 milligrams of Celebrex. Um, I'll give them a 30-day prescription with two refills and say if they're not feeling perfect at 30 days to, to refill the first, and if they're not feeling perfect at, at 60 days to refill the second uh, prescription. And some, some people refill the second and third ones, but a lot of people stop after 30 days. Um, so that, that's my practice right now with, with anti-inflammatories. I'm on the very aggressive side uh, of, this, of this equation. Um, and I know that, that it's still, I still get calls probably once or twice a month from a cardiologist being like, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Um, and, and we'll talk about the risks of, of not giving the Celebrex, which is clearly not nothing. It's, it's, it's a risk to not give the Celebrex. The knee's yeah. not going to be as good. Um, so we talk about those risks and balance them. And, and sometimes we compromise a little bit and I'll, I'll bump down to hundred, you know, twice daily or 200 once a day uh, in, in, in just a way to compromise with the cardiology people. Um, <laughs> but I don't know the answer to this. Um, uh, Alex, what are you doing? So I, uh, uh, a little bit different. I, I typically do hundred milligrams twice daily, um, but similar to you, it's essentially a 30 day supply plus two refills. Um, and similarly, you know, I mean, I, I, I often get calls from uh, various cardiologists about it. I mean, I, I think the key is shared decision-making with the patient and talking about the fact preoperatively that if they're going to have to be on a stronger oral anticoagulant, um, they're at slightly increased risk of getting some stiffness and they're at a higher risk of requiring some manipulation, um, and return to the OR. And so that's, that's an important point. And then secondly, is talking about the addition of a non-steroidal and, and talking about the, the hypothetical risk of that, um, which um, hopefully our, our study, um, you know, uh, reassures everyone that it's, it's a very reasonable thing to do. Um, but I, I'm a big believer in really sort of this, you know, preoperative and perioperative discussion with the patient and, and, and sharing the, the various pros and cons that, that, we, that we know. 
you know, I, I'm going to add in a, just a slight question, um, take editorial license. You know, we know that there are, um, and this is for all the authors or anyone in the audience, there are quite a number of factors that contribute to stiffness after knee replacement. Um, lack of early motion, lack of PT, uh, pain that prevents people from early motion, maybe uh, health literacy issues, you know, various social determinants of health and and maybe even some genetic predisposition. How much do you think, uh, maybe, and it's, it's hard to answer this question, but how much do you think this particular question related to the DOAX and the combination of NSAIDs uh, compares to those classically known causes of uh, arthrofibrosis? Is this a big issue? Will this really prevent it? Or if they still don't do the PT, you know, and or the home exercise program, um, you know, you know how, how big of an issue do you think it is? That's a that's a tough question, Ira. I, I don't know. Sorry, if somebody else see the answer. I don't want to jump in, but I think that um, the anti uh, the anti inflammatory is a very important has a very important role in a, in a post total knee replacement patient in in folks who who are on a CPM machine, you know, on the day of surgery versus uh, starting therapy two or three weeks later after surgery. Um, and just doing a home exercise program initially. I, I, the basic data shows that a good uh, corticosteroid can have a dramatic impact on arthrofibrosis, especially in capsular fibrosis. And um, the NSAIDs are, you know, kind of a junior version of that. Uh, the the um, large um, multi-center uh, study that uh, is run out of Mayo looking at Celebrex and manipulation, you know, at least from our institution, we haven't been able to contribute very many patients because everybody's on Celebrex to, to begin with. And so it's hard to, to identify anybody who's got a manipulation who hasn't been on that. Um, I think it's a big deal. Obviously, I, I, you know, I think the social determinants of health and the, um, and the, the, the need to do rehab and the, to obviously do the surgery correctly make a huge impact. But assuming we're all really great surgeons and the surgery is done correctly, implants are going in well, then I think these other factors, the biological modifying factors really do make a difference. Awesome. Hey. I've, I've got a good anecdote. Uh, sorry, Russia, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just had something uh, to say. I'm glad Richard is going to add uh, uh, Cox twos next week. I think he's taking care of my uncle out there. So good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to helping him out. You know, I just, John, before you, you jump in, I just wanted to sort of add quickly to that. Um, you know, the, the funny thing is, if you look at this chat, we're, we are, we're all doing different things a little bit. Um, we all have sort of different protocols. And <clears throat> one thing that, that Roshan brought up, I think is a key point. You know, obviously, you know, the, the, the genesis of, of arthrofibrosis is multifactorial. But, um, you know, I, I have, you know, what we've seen, I think, over the years with the increased use of dexamethasone intraoperatively and postoperatively, uh, and some, you know, increasing data looking at uh, corticosteroid use postoperatively. Uh, that's one thing that, that if patients really have a contraindication to Celebrex or an NSAID postoperatively, that is something that I will add, uh, because I do think that there is a, a really molecular contribution to this that, that matters. And so, um, you know, I think there's a very, you know, minimal risk to infection, but there, there is something about the fibrosis process that, that Celebrex is clearly, or any of the NSAIDs are clearly helping with. And if somebody is just not a candidate for, for an anti-inflammatory, I'm sending them home with a Medrol dose pack. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a great, a great idea because uh, you don't have the same contraindications there. Um, and it's something I picked up from you uh, probably way too late, but <laughs> I started doing that more, more recently uh, and the patients who really can't do it. And I, I, I think it's, it's been helpful, but I would to your point, I've got a, I, I've, your question earlier. I've got a, um, don't have any definite answers, but I've got a, a good anecdote. And um, you know, our our practices when we don't have wonderful science to fall back on are often you know driven by these these patient anecdotes and and, and experiences that we have. Um, and I, I've had I've got five or six of these cases um, you know in the past few years. But I, but one recently that comes to mind is I I, I did a knee replacement in gosh the fall of 2022 in a really nice Catholic priest um, from Queens, 
um, who goes on these mission trips and he had just terrible arthritis. He'd been, been ignoring it for a long time. Pretty good motion. He was, you know, typical, typical arthritic knee replacement patient, like five to one fifteen or something, so, something similar to that. Um, do his knee replacement surgery goes beautifully. Um, great, great x-rays, uh, post-op this, this gentleman in March of 2020, uh, was in good health, but he got COVID. Um, he had a, a bunch of lower extremity blood clots, um, had to come into the hospital in March of 2020, um, was treated, um, quite aggressively by the vascular team based on the extent of his, his, um, venous thrombobolic disease and was kept on Xeralto, uh, post-operatively. So he came to me on Xeralto. We did his surgery. It went well. Um, I talked to him about the, this sort of conundrum, the bleeding risks of adding an anti-inflammatory. I recommended doing that. Um, he was really scared off by, by doing that. And so he said, no, he didn't want to do that. And so he, he went back on his, his Zeralto dose, which was, I think, 20, 20 milligrams once a day. I think I cut him back to half dose for a week and then, then put him back on his, on his you know, dose of 20 milligrams of Zeralto. And he just did so poorly after surgery. Um, you know, I, I saw him at two weeks. He was, you know, maybe maybe 10 to 60 degrees at two weeks, really swollen. Um, it, saw him every couple of weeks, uh, uh, out, out to six weeks. I think I manipulated him at seven weeks because he couldn't get past 70 degrees of flexion. Um, got him in, in the, in the, minute, in the, in the pre-op bay to back to 120. Um, and then saw him the next week and he was back at 70 again. Um, wow. And at, at this point, you know, he's, he's now like gosh, nine weeks, 10 weeks out from surgery, you know, can barely get to 70 degrees, miserable. He can't do stairs. He lives on a you know, seventh floor apartment. He can't do stairs. Um, so I, I, you know, I talked to him again about, you know, can we please, please add Celebrex? And he said, well, no, I don't want to add Celebrex because I don't want to bleed. So I reached out to the vascular surgeon who I know at Columbia and asked him if we can take him off the Zerato for a bit of time. And we, we take him off the Zeralto. He agrees to it. I said, can I have two weeks off Zeralto? Put him on Celebrex 200 BID, take him off the Zeralto. See him back two weeks later. He's, he's at 100 degrees. Wow. Um, I, I, I messaged the vascular surgeon again. I said, can I have two more weeks, please? And he said, yeah. And I see him back in two more weeks. He's at 120. Um, so this is a guy I really struggled with, really struggled with. And stopping one and starting the other uh, was much better than a manipulation was much better than he was doing PT five days a week, M much better than anything that, um, you know, that, that we were doing physically. It was something biologically going on that I, I don't fully understand yet. Uh, uh, Roshan understands a lot better than I do, but I, I don't understand what's going on there. Um, but the association we see again and again and again, and it's, it's anecdotes like that, that make me think for some patients, this makes a big difference. And I, I would love to not give people these medications after surgery and put everybody on aspirin, um, yeah. for a two or three week holiday to start that, that early period. And, um, yeah, I, I know we can't do that for everybody, but I think, you know, we should consider pushing back a little bit on these patients who, who think they need to be on these you know, every day of their lives, because maybe they don't, maybe they could be off for a couple of weeks. Yeah. I just want to give two, two, two points. One is, uh, I think you get a medal for being able to get the vascular surgeon on the phone. Uh, number one, <laughs> um, Number two, uh, here at the journal, we call anecdotes experience, <laughs> you know, and uh, rather than it's not the journal of anecdotes and innovation, it's the journal of experience and innovation. So uh, these experiences are important because they inform us, uh, sort of like Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, we, we don't really have hunches. We learn from multiple small little areas of experience that lead us to the kind of work that Cindy started and that you guys continued with this great, with this great study. But I think that's a great anecdote, a great, great experience. I even have to correct myself. Um, there was a, a, another couple of questions. I, I'm going to switch out. Jose, you had a question, Jose Chacon. Yes, I did. Um, um, I was considering the fact that with the use of aspirin in your, um, your dream plan there. I was considering, have you done a uh, aspirin prophylactically for um, for knees? And in the chat, I was explaining about a study from JVJS published last year about how they use uh, aspirin 
that was prophylactically for BTE um, risk, but also it improved stiffness and decreased uh, any uh, venous uh, and bog uh, episode. So I was wondering if that's something you have considered or something Mike considered. Just to understand your question, uh, I'm looking through your, the chat message now, using aspirin for VT prophylaxis in hip as well as knee? Um, well, in this case for knee, we, since the uh, the study was involved in for hip in this case here. So I was curious to know if it could be also applied to the knees as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, we focused, uh, the, the baseline group in this study was aspirin. So I, if... I think um, the whole, as for the most part, the world of arthroplasty has gone to using aspirin in both hip and knee and hip fractures from, from some of the um, larger inner uh, multi-center studies um, that uh, Jay Parvizi really um, organized. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I think that's the first step and moving away from the DOAX to an aspirin-based VT prophylaxis more easily allows for an additional anti-inflammatory, which in this case was celecoxib and, and or um, meloxicam. Can I jump in a little bit? Um, you know, your, your question, your question, Jose, is actually reminds me, you know, I, I don't know how many people in this group uh, used to do hip resurfacings, but, you know, we did a study way back when, when, when resurfacings was, was really in its heyday, uh, and we're talking about sort of the late 2000s. Um, you know, if you if you if anybody has or has not seen a resurfacing from a posterior approach, it's pretty brutal. Um, you know, if, if you go in to do a resurfacing from a posterior approach, you know, obviously resurfacing saves the femoral head. Well, to be able to get to the acetabulum, you have to take a Cobb elevator, elevate the abductors off of of the outer table of the pelvis tuck the femoral head into that sort of pocket up above the joint, do your cup, finish your, your, your femoral head, uh, put, you know, relocate the head. And then, you know, obviously these people go on their way. You can imagine with that amount of stripping and dissection, there was a fair amount of heterotopic ossification that folks would see up through uh, the hips. So we did a study um, because again, this was sort of in the, the, the early days of, of multimodal um, uh, pain management after surgery. And, and so we looked at, at those patients who got Lovenox postoperatively versus the patients who got aspirin and Celebrex. And, you know, of course, the, the Celebrex and aspirin group had a much lower rate of heterotopic ossification. So again, there, there is something to this, this is, to your point, this is not necessarily just a hip or a knee thing. It, there is some sort of, you know, again, it's, it's the, the anti-inflammatory effect of all of this is, is, um, it's real and palpable. And, you know, it just, it doesn't, you know, just translate to only knees and orthofibrosis. So, um, you know, a lot of you guys are too young to remember hip resurfacings, but, um, I remember, I remember remembers. Remember many revisions too. So, uh, and then a number of great successes, you know, so a lot of great successes. Yeah, really, really were. And, and they were ignored. Uh, but that was a great, great question. Sam, Mar uh, well, there was another question um, about Marty. Marty Nichols, you had a question about the monitoring or? Yeah, no, I was just curious if, if you're getting notes and getting phone calls from your, from the cardiology department and stuff, are you then changing your post-op touch points with your patient at all? Do you try to see them more often? Do you have a checkpoint with your MA or your nurses more frequently? Or does your post-op after you discharge them home stay exactly the same? Marty, mine is exactly the same. There's, you know, the the, the major um, uh, monitoring would have to be blood tests for kidney related issues or or uh, coagulation uh, coagulability. Um, I I don't. I'm a little allergic to cardiology phone calls, so I tend to push the least. I think of my partners. Um, I'll try to get the holiday from a from a DOAC to use an NSAID, and if I can't get that, then I I just use the um, anticoagulant without an NSAID, but have a low threshold to add a um, steroid, uh, uh, you know, like a, a daily steroid for a couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I don't do any additional monitoring. I mean, we have, we have a pretty frequent touch point anyway, every couple of days for the first two weeks um, with either myself or my nurse or my PA or 
the hospital calling the patients. So that just phone calls uh, are, are pretty frequent, but we don't do it differently for, for these patients. Um, one thing I was curious about, Cindy, what, how are you guys, uh, uh, how are you and, and your colleagues at special surgery dealing with this issue? Is there a protocol? Is it, um, you know, individual sort of management like, like we're doing over at, 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 on the West side? Yeah, a lot of things similar to you guys. Um, so, you know, we pretty much do aspirin for everybody unless they come in on an anticoagulant. Um, our medical, you know, clearance doctors frequently recommend uh, DOEX for patients with an elevated BMI just because of the BMI, and most surgeons push back against that. So we're pretty much doing uh, aspirin for everybody uh, unless they come in on something. And then um, our end set of choice is meloxicam for almost everybody. We don't, not a lot of people use Celebrex. I think just as a cultural thing, most people use meloxicam just because their colleagues do. Um, so we'll do meloxicam for everybody unless they have kidney issues. Um, you know, we do have patients here and there who come in on a DOAC because they have a history of AFib and they also have some kidney issues and then they can't get anti-inflammatories. And those are, you know, the same struggles that, that we've been discussing all evening. Um, I haven't given anybody a, like a few days of steroids, um, to go home with, but we do several of us at HSS do, um, two doses of Decadron post-op for patients who stay overnight. And still, you know, the, the majority of our knee patients uh, do stay overnight in the hospital. So we'll do um, eight milligrams Q8 of Decadron uh, starting in the OR and then two doses post-op. Um, and that does seem to, you know, in some of the studies that we've done in the orthopedic department here uh, in conjunction with our anesthesiologists, um, we haven't looked at it specifically for the issue of arthrofibrosis, but has helped with decreasing pain and, um, you know, probably something that we should look at in terms of, uh, range of motion after knee replacement. But for the most part, aspirin, uh, if they can't get aspirin or, or if they come in on their, their anticoagulation, we continue their anticoagulation. We give them, uh, meloxicam as long as their kidneys are okay. Um, and then we do, uh, we do the in hospital decadron. Very awesome. Um, yeah, I, I'm just going to kind of push a little bit on a question. I, I'm going back a few decades um, um, and remembering in that uh, the three orthoplasty surgeons during my fellowship, Dick Rothman, Bob Booth, and Bill Hozak, um, all followed the same exact protocol. Now, I'm just, you got, uh, I'm talking to the Columbia team have some different protocols amongst each other. Um, how come you can't just do one protocol? <laughs> I'm kind of having fun with this a little bit. I think of this as a, as a laboratory of states or laboratory of silos. We, we meet once a quarter and we, we all conform. We do the exact same protocol. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, I read a paper and I start doing something different. And then Jeff reads a paper and he tweaks one thing. And we figure out what's working better, if anything. Right. And, and then we come back and share it with each other at the next meeting and we conform again. So I, I think it's a, we, we don't follow the same protocol in a good way. Yeah, but we do. I agree. We do meet regularly and try and try to update things and keep things moving. Just, just as the describes. It's Greg, Greg Brown. Greg Brown. Brown. What was you going to say? I, I think that's exactly the wrong reason. Um, I, I spent four weeks out at Intermountain Healthcare with Brent James, who runs their quality department, and, and, and they're amazing. And, and the point is, is if, if you all waited till that next meeting and all agreed to do the same thing, you know, for the next three months or whatever your meeting cycle is, is, is but if everybody's doing something different, you never get enough numbers to know which exactly you're always going on your hunch. You never really have the numbers to, to decide is this better or not, it would seem like. You can't wait for three months. It's tough. It's a tough situation. <laughs> yeah. Especially I, I, with, with good, solid, healthy egos. That's true. Uh, I had an earlier question. Um, yeah. A few months ago, there was a, um, and I don't remember the, the name of the surgeon. You, I'm sure you do, Ira, but... He was talking about he holds the knee and doesn't move it for two or three days and lets it calm down. 
And then when he's moving it, it's not swollen and they, and his patients move and regain their motion much better. Do that was, remember? yeah, that was uh, Andy Wickline. Okay. Andy Wickline so, really believes that swelling and uh, peripheral edema cause a lot of pain or a lot of stiffness. And uh, he doesn't move him for a couple of days and then he doesn't do PT. And he just does a, an aggressive uh, home ec- supervised home exercise program. That's that's the one you're referring to, yeah. Right. Yes. And so, do we have it wrong? I mean, is is Dr. Wicklin right? Where we're, we've all been trained, you got to move the knee, you got to move the knee, so it doesn't get stiff, and we'd be better off letting it calm down. I mean, when I trained, we used to do that with rheumatoids. We couldn't, we wouldn't move rheumatoids right away because their tissue was so fragile. We wanted to let them calm down for three, three days or something. And then we'd start therapy. And, and do we need to think about going back to something like that? Well, I think John, John Cooper's uh, experiential anecdote (laughs) um, on the patient who was so stiff for so long. And then he added the NSAIDs is, is very demonstrative of, um, a lot of things show showing how much we don't know. John, what do you think about that? Yeah, this I agree. There's so much we don't know here, Ira. And uh, Greg, to your to your point, um, I've I've moved strongly in that direction. I I push back against physical therapy for the first two weeks um, uh, or of my total knee patients because I I do think it can be counterproductive. Um, I ask patients to straighten their leg, um, you know, just out straight on a, on a table for 15 minutes each day. And I ask them to sit in a chair and just let it bend back to about 90 degrees for 15 minutes once a day and otherwise rest and ice in bed and, and keep the physical therapists away. And I found anecdotally, you know, over a couple of years of doing that, probably post COVID doing that, um, we haven't gone back and looked at it yet, but I, I've, I found less pain, less swelling, faster regaining of motion um, with that. And I've been happier with that. And patients seem to have been happier. It's, it's a, fair number, a fair bit of discussion in the office about why I don't want them to see a physical therapist right away, why I don't want a therapist coming to their house right away. Um, but, uh, but I have found it helpful. And I think that, that you know, Andrew Wickline is a smart, talented surgeon who, who is probably onto something um, w- with that. Um, I'm not the only one who's, who's doing that at Columbia. I think several other of us are, you know, feel somewhat similarly about early PT after, after total knee. I'd like, um, we're nearing the end. So there's two things I want to do. One is I'd, I'd like, um, John, you or one of the people in your group to sort of sum up a, a couple of things and what are some of the next steps that you guys are thinking of based on what you learned here. Yeah. Maybe choose one of you guys to give us a clue about what's coming out of Columbia next on this thing. See, Jeff, you, Jeff, you want to take that, or you want me Roshan, to take it, or do you guys want um, me to take it? Go ahead, John. All, all right. So, so, so to summarize the, our, our study, it, it was a retrospective study of uh, you know several several years of our experience with with slightly different um, management of, of patients. Uh, on um, direct oral anticoagulation, um, so Xeralto Eliquis type medications, uh, where some patients got uh, a concurrent NSAID and some uh, didn't. And we compared those patients to a group of patients who were just getting sort of standard aspirin plus plus anti-inflammatory. And we found that patients who were on the direct oral anticoagulation medication alone um, had a higher rate of stiffness uh, and more difficult time regaining their motion uh, compared to aspirin. But when we gave them that sort of that group of patients who needed that medication uh, a concurrent anti-inflammatory, we were able to mitigate some of that risk of stiffness um, with the concurrent anti-inflammatory. Um, we're still hypothesizing about the mechanism of that. Um, I think our study was a little bit underpowered to find some of the things we were looking for. But I think this study, um, you know, number as as Dr. Shaw mentioned, um, confirms the findings in Cindy Collenberg's 2018 JBJS study um, that that anticoagulation can can be a, a, a real risk factor for stiffness, and provides some hypothesis, uh, some further hypothesis as to what might be involved in that. And I think future directions for study. Um, 
could be doing this in a more organized, prospective, potentially randomized fashion. That would almost definitely mean, mean, mean a multi-center study where we could take patients who were on um, uh, these direct oral anticoagulants and randomize them to either getting a concurrent NSAID or uh, no concurrent NSAID and then follow the range of motion, follow their swelling, follow their risks of manipulation and, and confirm these findings in a, in a better study. Um, I think that other things that have come out of this from our perspective are in these patients would steroids be a, a reasonable option that maybe don't increase the bleeding risk to the same degree. And I think that's also worth studying as well because we've found benefits of steroids and you know, a number of other circumstances uh, around the, the perioperative management of total knee patients. So I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot we don't understand here. It's clearly something that makes a difference for patients. And I think this is an area that, um, that we'll see more study um, uh, from our institution and from others in the upcoming several years. That's amazing. I, uh, I know we're out of time. I want to uh, sincerely thank uh, uh, Jeff Gella, John Cooper, uh, Cindy Kallenberg, uh, Roshan Shah, and uh, Alex Newworth, uh, Alexander Newworth, uh, for one, um, choosing Joey to produce this article, which is a home run and has uh, uh, at least changed Richard Southgate as well as a number of us now. I know two of the joint surgeons from uh, Bronx Care are on, and I have a feeling there's going to be a change in the protocol in about 20 minutes. Um, and I want to thank all everybody and participants for joining us again. Um, uh, re really a pleasure to have you guys on. Uh, and it's it's an honor to have people from Columbia on the Joey um, Journal Club. And I hope everyone had a good time.